Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. In the last video of the LFP series, I covered CATL's M3P chemistry from the perspective of cycle life, cost, and energy density. That is, product level questions. But I also briefly mentioned in that video that CATL's M3P battery chemistry appears to be an LMFP type chemistry. That is, an LFP chemistry doped with manganese to increase its energy density. The question is, if it was just a matter of adding manganese to increase the energy density of LFP, why wasn't that done earlier? The short story is that batteries are complex, multi-scale, multi-physics systems, which means there's always demons in the machine that have to be exercised to bring a new chemistry to market. So today, I'm going to explain what those specific demons are for LMFP and how CATL may have solved them with their M3P chemistry. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, YouTube members, and Twitter subscribers, as well as Rebellionaire.com. They specialize in helping investors manage concentrated positions. Rebellionaire can help with covered calls, risk management, and creating a money master plan from your financial first principles. In order to understand CATL's M3P chemistry, let's work from the known to the unknown. Most people who follow batteries are familiar with the LFP chemistry. LFP stands for lithium ferrophosphate, or in more common language, lithium iron phosphate. In the last video of the LFP series, I said that the crystal structure of LMFP is the same as LFP except that some of the iron is swapped for manganese. The manganese increases the voltage potential of the LFP, and it's the reason why LMFP can have up to 15-20% to higher energy density than LFP. However, the addition of the manganese creates electronic conductivity issues, Jan Teller effects, dissolution issues, and ionic conductivity issues. Let's walk through each. Starting with electrical conductivity, as I explained in the LFP science video, LFP has poor electrical conductivity because the iron atoms in the crystal structure are too far apart to conduct electricity. The way that was solved was by adding conductive carbon coatings to the cathode particles, and by making the cathode particles smaller, which reduces the distance that the electrons have to travel through the cathode material. Adding manganese makes the electrical conductivity even worse. Additionally, manganese is resistant to the carbon coating process. The solution to that is to limit the amount of manganese used in LMFP batteries, and it's one of the reasons why not all the iron in the LFP crystal structure is swapped out for manganese. By leaving some iron in the crystal structure, around 20-50%, to 50 rather than completely replacing it with manganese, it minimizes the electrical conductivity challenges of using manganese, while still providing most of its increased voltage and energy density benefits. Besides improving electrical conductivity, leaving some iron in the cathode also helps with Jan Teller effects and dissolution issues. Let's get into those now, starting with the basics of how a cathode works. Before the battery cell is charged with an LMFP chemistry, the state of charge of the manganese atoms in the cathode are 2 plus. Then, when the battery cell is charged, the charge of the manganese atoms changes to 3 plus. Both of those charge states, 3 plus and 2 plus, cause degradation in the cathode that reduces cycle life. First, manganese 3 plus is subject to Jan Teller effects. What are Jan Teller effects? All atoms have electrons which configure themselves in orbitals around the atom. In some electron configurations in some metallic elements, when the charge state of the atom changes by gaining or losing an electron, the orbitals become unbalanced because the energy is no longer distributed evenly, and the shape of the orbitals becomes distorted. If the atom is part of a crystal, the distortions in the shape of the orbitals changes the angles and distances between that atom and the other atoms in the crystal structure, which in turn distorts the shape and volume of the crystal structure. When the shape and volume of the crystal structure changes, the cathode particle that the crystal is part of can fracture. Those fractures open up fresh surface area which can react with the electrolyte, causing degradation and reduced cycle life. Second, as for manganese 2 plus, it's attracted to and dissolves into the electrolyte. Some of those manganese 2 plus ions make their way to the graphite anode, where two things can happen. 
First, the manganese 2 plus ion can react with the solid electrolyte interface, which causes degradation that reduces cycle life. For the purposes of today's video, the solid electrolyte interface is just a protective chemical layer on the anode that makes the battery last longer. Second, the manganese 2 plus can deposit as metallic manganese that can short out the battery cell, which is a safety issue. Now that we know how manganese causes yon teller effects and dissolution issues in LMFP cathodes, what are the engineering solutions to get around those issues? This brings us to CATL's M3P chemistry. Reporting out of China suggests that besides being an LMFP chemistry, CATL's M3P chemistry replaces some of the iron ore manganese with magnesium, aluminum, and zinc. I don't have confirmation with a teardown that those elements are accurate, but they do make sense, because those elements are often used to stabilize cathodes and improve their cycling performance. Rather than going through each doping element, I'm going to focus on magnesium. Note that aluminum and zinc may do a better job of reducing Jan Teller effects, which is why they may have been added in addition to magnesium. But since there's more and better research on magnesium, and it likely operates in the same way to reduce Jan Teller effects as aluminum and zinc, magnesium is what I'm going to cover. So how does magnesium reduce Jan Teller effects? Instead of participating in the electrochemical reactions when the battery is charging and discharging, it remains in the same charge state while the electrochemically active manganese and iron cycle back and forth between 2 plus and 3 plus charge states. That has an anchoring effect on the crystal structure and prevents it from warping. That effect is so strong that it only takes doping with a few percent of magnesium to anchor the crystal structure. However, magnesium has another beneficial effect for LMFP. It improves the ionic conductivity of LMFP, which tends to be poor compared to LFP. For the purposes of this video, by ionic conductivity, I mean how quickly and easily lithium ions can move through the cathode crystals when the battery cell is charged or discharged. The way magnesium improves the ionic conductivity is by modifying the bond lengths and angles within the crystal structure. The image on screen shows a pure LMFP octahedron on the left and a magnesium doped LMFP octahedron on the right. One of the angles on the LMFP is 108.98 degrees, and the corresponding angle on the magnesium doped version is 104.58 degrees. Why is that important? Zooming out to the broader crystal structure, we can see nine of the octahedra that were shown in the last image, but this time in the context of the rest of the crystal structure. When the battery is charged and discharged, the lithium ions wiggle their way through the crystal structure. By changing the angles and the lengths of the bonds within the octahedra with magnesium, it creates a slight change to the crystal structure. That, in turn, creates a smoother path for the lithium ions to flow into and out of the crystal structure, which means more lithium is available for cycling when the battery charges and discharges, meaning more energy. The question is, how much of an impact does doping with magnesium have on the energy capacity of the cathode? The graph on screen shows that the net result of magnesium doping is an increase in capacity from 134.1 mAh per gram to 146.4 mAh per gram, or about a 9% improvement. Not bad for swapping out just 4% of the electrochemically active iron with inactive magnesium. Finally, what about the dissolution issues with manganese 2 plus? Those can be mitigated and possibly even solved by layering three to four engineering fixes for the cathode. First, as I said earlier, only about 50 to 80 percent of the iron is swapped out for manganese in LMFP chemistries. The iron is much less likely to dissolve in the electrolyte than the manganese, so one of the ways to reduce the dissolution issues is to stick closer to 50 percent iron in the cathode formulation. However, that doesn't fundamentally solve the dissolution issues. It only reduces them. 
The second way to reduce dissolution is to prevent the cathode particles from fracturing. As we saw earlier, Jan Teller effects can cause the cathode crystal structure to distort, which in turn can cause the cathode particles to crack. As they fracture, it exposes more cathode surface area for the manganese to dissolve into the electrolyte. But as I showed, elements like magnesium, aluminum, and zinc can be used to anchor the crystal structure, which should reduce distortions in the crystal structure from Jan Teller effects, and therefore reduce cracking. That is, using doping elements like magnesium to solve the Jan Teller effects simultaneously helps with the dissolution issues. But again, this fix still isn't a fundamental and direct fix to the dissolution issues. It just mitigates the dissolution issues. Let's take a look at a more direct and fundamental solution to the dissolution challenge, particle engineering. For the purposes of today's video, there are two engineering solutions that can modify the cathode particles so that the manganese is isolated from the electrolyte. The first option, increasing the thickness of the carbon coating used on the cathode particles, would be a simple fix. But, because the carbon coating doesn't store energy, it would reduce the energy density of the cathode. So, this is an option, but not the best option. The second option, a concentration gradient structure for the cathode particles, involves growing the cathode particles in a way that results in a high ratio of iron to manganese near the surface of the cathode particle and a lower ratio of iron to manganese towards the core of the particle. That is, the bulk of the soluble manganese is safely tucked away in the core, which reduces the chances that it'll come into contact with the electrolyte and dissolve into it. In my view, this makes the concentration gradient option the most effective way to isolate the manganese from the electrolyte while not requiring any additional mass or material like the carbon coating option. So, I expect this is the option that most LMFP battery producers will choose. The drawback to the concentration gradient option is that it requires a more complex and expensive process to produce the cathode particles. As I said in my battery roadmaps video, LMFP battery cells like CATL M3P are currently estimated to cost about 5% more than LFP battery cells. With that said, over time, through economies of scale, and due to the fact that LMFP batteries are more energy dense and therefore require less material, LMFP batteries should end up costing less. In summary, although it seems there's only a small difference between LFP and LMFP battery chemistries at a conceptual level, where some of the iron is swapped out for manganese, LMFP is much more challenging to commercialize due to things like Jan Teller effects and dissolution issues. Those issues mean that even though adding manganese to an LFP chemistry can increase energy density by up to 15 to 20 percent and do so at a similar cost to LFP batteries, which which creates a big market opportunity, it's taken about 10 to 15 years of research to bring the chemistry to market. However, even with the energy density and cost benefit that LMFP batteries have over LFP batteries, my view is that LFP will likely maintain some advantages over LMFP chemistries, such as cycle life. That's for a number of reasons, but let's look at just two. First, LFP batteries operate at lower voltages and in a narrower voltage range, meaning they're more electrochemically stable. Second, I suspect that some of the manganese in the concentration gradient cathode particles will still find a way to dissolve into the electrolyte solution and react with the anode to reduce battery life. That could occur as a result of manufacturing imperfections or from fracturing that occurs in the cathode particles during cycling. If LFP does maintain an advantage in cycle life, rather than being completely superseded by LMFP, as some people are speculating, it'll likely be a around for a few more decades. That's because different use cases require different performance characteristics, and each battery chemistry has fundamental advantages that lends it to a specific use case. If you'd like to know more about that, watch my battery roadmaps video. As a side note, now that the chemistry issues appear to be solved for LMFP, companies like CATL are now faced with the next challenge for LMFP, scaling it. It can take years to work the kinks out of new manufacturing processes, so that's how long it may take before we see LMFP batteries in wide use by the major EV producers like BYD and Tesla. 
As a final note, a big thanks to Battery Bulletin and Dr. Yuho Heiska, who can be found on X. Battery Bulletin and Dr. Heiska helped me fill in the gaps for information that wasn't readily available in the literature. As always, any errors in the script are of course due to my own interpretation or communication errors. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting the channel by using the links in the description. Also, consider following me on X. I often use X as a testbed for sharing ideas, and X subscribers like my Patreon supporters generally get access to my videos a week early. On that note, a special thanks to my YouTube members, X subscribers, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.